Welcome back into the KC Sports Authority podcast. I'm your host, Keegan Russell. It's been several weeks since our last episode, but we are super excited to bring you a new one today. And this is one I think Jayhawk fans are going to enjoy. In today's episode, Spencer, JB, and myself are joined by a very special guest to help us preview the upcoming KU Puerto Rico trip that's taking place here in a couple days. Um, kind of give an overview of that trip, talk about what fans should expect from this trip, you know, which players could have the biggest impact during during the week, and which player or players have the most to gain from this experience. And then we might dive into a little bit more K basketball offseason. So let's get started and dive into this. So fellas, I've been looking forward to having this guy on for quite a while, and I'm super pumped that he was able to join us. So with that, let's welcome in Derek Johnson of Rock Chalk Sports Talk over on 1320 KLWN and Lawrence, as well as the host for the Locked On Daily Jayhawk podcast. Derek, thanks so much for joining us today, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, guys. That was a very kind intro. I, I don't think I deserve <laughs> quite that, but I appreciate it. Glad to talk some KU today. Yeah, this is this is why we do the podcast is to, to express our love of Jayhawk sports. So I wanted to start with kind of just – Give us a rundown of what your experience is like getting to talk KU sports, you know, one for your career every day of the week, and then some of the side things you're doing with Lockdown Jayhawks. Uh, I mean, just from like a, a job level, like, you know, it's it's hard to complain about work when, you know, you'll hear stories about friends, family, whoever being like, oh, man, I had to deal with this today in my nine to five. And it's like, oh, you won't believe what I had to talk about. It, right. It's like, you know, it's, I, I can't complain about it. It's, it's a great job. Love doing it. I uh, love being Lawrence, love the local Lawrence community and, you know, the kind of surrounding areas here in Kansas. So I absolutely love doing it. Um, you know, Locked On creates another um, time crunch during my day in a different way, but it's a lot of fun and uh, getting to kind of, I don't know, hit on some of the more um, emphatic points day to day uh, of the KU stuff. Whereas with, you know, doing live radio every day, that's a different type of bear where, you know, it is more free form. It is more long form. Mm. And, uh, you know, both have their own challenges, both have their, their own fun things about them. So I, I love what I get to do and, uh, you know, no complaints there. And you've had quite the wild last six months or so from a content standpoint, not just, you know, the excitement of KU football off season with huge recruiting pickups and transfers, you know, the incredibly wild KU basketball off season that it's been so far, but, also, you're your big time fan of the Denver Nuggets. And of course, they captured their their title over the summer um, with fellow Jayhawk Christian Brown. So you really haven't had any shortage of content to discuss. What is you know the last six months been like for you from a fan's perspective of of KU and Denver, just being able to experience all that while also getting to talk about it? I never thought that I would get to see the Nuggets win an NBA championship. Um it's just like one of those sports was like you have to have like a top three player in the world. And it's just, it was so tough for that to happen. And even Jokic a couple of years ago when he won his first MVP, it was like, okay, this guy's clearly really good, but is he ever going to win an NBA finals? I don't know. You, you just get used to not seeing it in the NBA when you grow up and it's like, well, you're going to have to team together with three stars and they're going to have to sign free agents. It's like, well, that's not really, you know, what happens to Denver. So uh, that was actually a nice warming surprise for me. That, that was really cool to, to get to go through all that. But yeah, man, over these last six months, it's it's actually been one of the more crazy, I would say, just like off seasons march through now that that I can remember, because typically we're kind of grasping at straws yeah. for, you know, it's one thing with Locked On, that's a 20 minute show every day. Uh, with Rock Truck Sports Stock doing three hours of radio day when there's not much going on, and the Royals are usually bad, which, yeah, they're really bad again. <laughs> Honestly, like the transfer portal, um, I know coaches probably hate it, but it is like one of the best things from a content perspective. Yeah, because you just you just get to throw out projections and previews and <laughs> every day, and then three days later, oh well, I was wrong about that player transfer, but here's what we got. So yeah, it's it's been fun, a lot of excitement. And you just kind of touched on it. So let's just dive into the off season that it has been. I know you've talked about this on several of your episodes as well as on Rock Chalk Sports Talk, but is this the wildest KU basketball off season we've seen? It's certainly the most I can remember. Now, I don't know if somebody knows stuff from like the 70s or 80s or something where it's like, well, they had to do this and that to bring Danny Manning aboard or Will Chamberlain or something. You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's something there, but I would think so because you even go back, whatever, 30, 40, 50 years ago, transfer portal wasn't as rampant. Um, recruiting was just different. There wasn't NIL, all this stuff. So uh, probably modern era 
it would just make sense that, you know, more recent days are just more complicated in general. And then you look at the combination of how many players have left. We've seen big chunks of, of a bunch of players leave before, but then you have this many players come in from different avenues. This, uh, like a couple players who were supposed to come with you then end up going somewhere else. What happened with the two freshmen with Chris Johnson and Marcus Adams. You had a reverse of that essentially with the transfer with Zach Clemens. You still hypothetically, we're, I mean, we're, we're going to be in August here in a day and um, still don't have a full roster. Are they going to play with 10 guys? Are they going to play with 11? Are they going to play with 12? The fact that it's still not even done yet. And you landed the biggest transfer portal edition out there with Hunter Dickinson. Like, and you had an NBA draft decision that ended up coming back your way with Kevin McCuller. Yeah, it checks every box, checks every box. So, yes, this is the most wild one that I can remember. So, JB, I know you and I have talked about this as a fan's perspective that this has been a wild offseason. So, JB, just share with us again your your perspective as a fan trying to keep up with the day-to-day of the roster turnover, the excitement levels we've had talking about certain <laughs> players, the extreme disappointment the next day when they go somewhere else. But what has this been like for you just as a fan sitting back and watching this? Man, it, it's, it's simply been one of a kind. You know, the thing that I really – think back to when I when I kind of compare this season to other seasons was the hype and excitement um, either while I was still in college attending KU or shortly after graduating when I would be watching uh, YouTube announcements for players that were announcing where they were committing to and and jumping with joy and doing theoretical backflips when guys like Andrew Wiggins decided to come to Kansas or guys like um, or or the extreme sorrow when a guy like Malik Newman said he wasn't going to come to Kansas and then they eventually did transfer to Kansas, which we are all very thankful for. Thank you to that, uh, that season and that final four run we had, um, you know, we had a lot of stories and, you know, Derek, you kind of alluded to it already. We've had all these great stories combined into just this one season. So from a fan perspective, we have been spoiled in a word. Um, we have, gained Hunter Dickinson and that's the big name that everyone's everyone's doing backflips over and and really I'm just looking at this at the season like this could be something pretty special now we have some things to work on but it's a lot to look forward to for sure yeah and I know we'll, we'll get into some season preview stuff later and there's a lot lot to look forward to but let me kind of leave this open-ended to you guys and maybe Spencer you can start um, what has been the most surprising move moment topic of discussion for the off season in your guys's mind. I mean, I honestly thought it was McCuller coming back because I thought, I mean, bare minimum, he could at least get a two way contract. So I was very surprised that he came back because he was coming back to a really crowded roster that obviously shrunk down a little bit with some guys leaving. So I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised that that Kevin came back because we don't see a lot of guys turn down potential NBA money. I mean, even a two-way contract is, is well into the six-figure range. Uh, so I was I was surprised with that. And then obviously I was surprised with a lot of the departures. Um, Ernest Uday, I, I did not see coming. I, I knew one of the bigs was going to leave. I did not think it was going to be both. So uh, a not so pleasant surprise with that. Uh, and then finally getting Dickinson. I, I wanted to say I was confident on it, but at the end of the day, I was pretty nervous about it. So uh, I was glad we were able to grab him at the end. That definitely kicked off the offseason in a great way. I think I don't think there was much doubt that we weren't going to get Hunter all along, but that definitely kicked it off. But Derek, how about you? What's been the most shocking, surprising moment of the offseason so far? I would agree with Spencer. I did not think Kevin McCuller was going to come back. And then whatever it was, like a week or two before, um, ended up happening. You know what's funny? As, as you were going through some of those, like Ernest Ude, it starts to realize like, oh yeah, that did happen. Oh yeah, that did happen. Which just talks about how wild it is that there are going to be little bits and pieces of this off season that already, you know, once we get to the start of the season, it's going to feel like ages ago and maybe already do. Like I was just thinking back the McKenzie and Baco stuff where that was kind of on the opposite yeah. of Kevin McCuller, where it was like, oh, I think this guy's going to come to KU. And then it didn't happen like the complete opposite of it. So um, yeah, those would be the two that stick out to me most surprising, I would say, but yeah, Kevin McCuller, I, I think I said like in the off season at some point over some show, like I put, I think like a 15% tag on him coming back. I did not think it was going to happen. So that was a uh, kind of a nice surprise. Uh, I think from the KU perspective and uh, obviously someone who, you know, should have a big impact on this year. Absolutely. There's been, 
I can't even keep track of how many ins and outs we've had. There's what almost almost a dozen players have been affected by either transferring in, leaving, or supposedly transferring and then and then not coming here. Uh, how about this? And and each of you guys, anyone that wants to throw this out, go for it. Um, which outgoing departure um, from this off season do you guys think has gone to the best situation for them moving forward? Because I know we talk about this on ours a lot that. Even as a KU fan, when we're disappointed somebody leaves, like it's hard not to want to root for them still. You know, some of them when they have like a bad exit, you're you're kind of over it. But most of these guys, you know, there's no really harm that you feel toward them. So which, which guys do you think are in the best situation moving forward in their career? And I, I feel like the answer has got to be Ernest. I mean, he can immediately replace Eddie Lampkin um, over at TCU. And I think – I think with him leaving, of course, he has that instant starter role that he really wanted. Now he could have had that here. I mean, it, it's you never know what could have happened over the over the off season. Um, not to take away from Hunter, but there could have been a lot of time with both of them on the floor. Um, Hunter could have been that stretch guy, and Ernest could have just handled the post, and and, and we would have been fine. So I. I think back to losing Ernest as one of those, you know, downsides to this off season. Um, I will, I will point, point out that albeit he had a great destination. Uh, it was, it was a big blow. Um, the one thing that kept my spirits up was knowing that I have Hunter Dickinson and I have Dewan Harris, like everything will be fine. So the eternal optimist in me was just, um, you know, going, going with all smiles and hoping for the best. And I really do think he landed in a great spot. Yeah, I would say uh, Marcus Adams for me. I mean, it's hard to do a lateral move when you leave uh, the KU program. So going to a place like Gonzaga, um, you know, I think was a pretty good situation for him. Um, I think he's going to be in a scenario where, it, you know, there's still there's always going to be a loaded roster at, at the Zag. So stuff like playing time and roster construction and the how the rotations are going to break out might be similar. So I don't know if he was expecting a bigger change than that, but – uh, he still has a great coach. He still has a great program. So I think he he landed in a pretty good spot considering the program he left. Just to throw out a different name, because I think you guys nailed it with both those guys. Um, I actually really liked Joe Yesifu winding up at Washington State. You know, I, I go back to Charlie Moore, and uh, I, I just have kind of termed it Charlie Moore syndrome of a guy who clearly is like a good basketball player. He had good production at Cal, uh, had really good production to finish out his career at Miami after Kansas. But for whatever reason, just didn't work at Kansas, whether it was role fit, whether it was just, you know, not getting along with the system or whatever. And maybe the bright, the, the lights were too bright, right? It's just different being in Lawrence and, and playing here with kind of the attention like fully on you. It's just different. So, you know, clearly a good basketball player, but didn't work at Kansas. That's kind of what I'm wondering if it's going to happen with Joe Yesifu. Like he was a really good basketball player when he finished up at Drake. You go to Washington State. You know, the lights are going to be a little less bright there. You're kind of off to the side in the Pac-12. Uh, I really like their head coach. They run a very analytics-based offense. And um, I think that's one where he could have some success and have that kind of, you know, revived season where he becomes a, a nice little player in the Pac-12. So I would throw that one out there, too, that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we look up in, you know, February and, and Joe's averaging – you know, 11, 12 points per game for uh, a kind of a solid Pac-12 team. Yeah, and he's one that I hope gets a good bounce back here because you, you could just tell his time here, there was a combination of hopefulness of what he could do and then just extreme frustration of like, dude, come on, you were literally one of the most gifted athletes on the team. Why isn't this coming together like we saw at saw Drake? But, yeah, all these guys, different spots. I thought the Marcus Adams one was also kind of crazy and surprising. You know, barely gets here, already reclassifies to this season, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get some more inside scoops later on, on that process. It sounds like, you know, and uh, Derek, you talked about this too before, that maybe he was – KU was really looking at him for – the following season and Marcus was more like, no, I want to play this year. And then after all that movement, KU says, okay, let's bring you on. Just kind of peculiar and odd that that didn't, didn't stick. But I, I, I was shocked he didn't go back to UCLA because I know that was, you know, close to home for him. And if the, I want to be close to home talk was, you know, the main reason, then I think that would have made a lot of sense. But yeah, the Gonzaga pick for me was kind of random, but I think, I think he can excel there. He's kind of got that similar 
uh, framework to some of those six, seven, six, eight guys Gonzaga's had in the past. But yeah, it's been a wild off season and it's not even close to done. You know, at this point, what we're back to 10 scholarship players and still have to get into, do we finish at 11, 12, 13? You know, we've got like 35 walk-ons on the roster <laughs> and probably three of them could be a scholarship caliber player elsewhere. So, you know, maybe one of them gets bumped up, but just, Overall, it's been it's been quite nuts. And that kind of leaves us here to, you know, even though there's several months until the season starts, we've got Kansas basketball in just a couple days here. And so let's get into that. Uh, KU is taking their team down to Puerto Rico this upcoming week here. You know, by the time this gets dropped, I'm sure they'll already be down there and practicing and doing all that. But they are traveling to Puerto Rico August 1st through the 8th. They've got three games right now on the schedule. Um, August 3rd, 5th, and 7th. One of those games being against the Puerto Rico Select team, which right now is scheduled for August 3rd at 11 a.m., so next Thursday. Um, and then they are hopefully playing the Bahamas national team on Saturday, August 5th at 4 p.m. Central Time, and then again on August 7th at 11 a.m. And I know that one has fans excited about because there's some KU um a former KU player on that team and Remy Martin, but also a couple NBA guys that they might um, get to play with. You know, we don't really know for sure how that's going to shake out. Um, but Derek, what I want to start with for you in covering the team is what are some expectations or some thoughts you have initially going into this trip that you're kind of looking forward to one, you know, for covering the team, but two, you know, as a fan, what, what should we be looking at during this trip? Yeah, I mean, the, the Bohemian national team ones could be a, a great barometer in a certain sense, but we'll see who plays. I think Henry Greenstein of the Lawrence Journal World pointed out that they're playing like three or four games like on the same like day or something that the KU was playing them. So it might be one of those things where they, you know, have a bunch of guys on the roster and they split them up. We'll see how much of the, the star-studded cast of, yeah, DeAndre Ayton, Clay Thompson, all those guys actually play on the team KU is playing. But like, let's say – Hunter Dickinson does get to go up against DeAndre Ayton. He puts up 20 and 10. That's going to say a lot. That's going to be like very, very encouraging for the season. Um, honestly, I think, you know, for a lot of people who play starts the most at, at the shooting guard is, is going to be a, a very interesting conversation. But KJ Adams, man, like what, what is that going to look like? What's it going to look like next to Hunter Dickinson? What is he going to look like? Like, is he going to add to his game? Are we going to see more mid range? Are we going to see more of him dribbling the basketball? Uh, it, just nailing down what exactly that looks like in the front court is going to be my most interested piece of this whole week. Spencer, how about you? What's one thing you're looking forward to this week or hoping to to learn about the team this week? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I, I definitely agree with the KJ fit next to Hunter. And if he added the 12, 15 foot jumper for me, I think the point that I'm most interested in is the two guard spot, because we have obviously you have Timberlake, you have Arterio Morris. Spacing is going to be really odd on this team because you have your five guy that's most likely going to be your best perimeter shooter uh, if you don't, uh, you know, uh, put Timberlake in there. So uh because if, if we're going to go with Arterio Morris, you're going to have Harris, Morris, and McCuller, who not, none of whom are particularly strong shooters, you know, shot in that 35 to 38 range that you kind of want to see. So I'd be interested to see how he shapes that out, because if we're going to play a roster that has challenging spacing, I want to see how that looks like with what kind of sets we run, how long, you know, those rotations stand, if Bill's going to make more substitutions earlier on in the game. And I'm honestly excited to see how much he experiments because this is a game where you can do that, you know. Uh, so I, I'm curious to see all the different combinations Bill's going to throw out there. JB, same question to you, yeah. man. What are you looking forward to? And a couple things. I think I think right off the bat, I think we're all really excited to see what Hunter looks like in a KU jersey that's not actually photoshopped on him <laughs> or not in a studio. You know, what does it look like in a game? And what does it look like to see him uh, perform under Bill's self system? I think would be uh, really interesting to see. Spencer, you alluded to it. You know, what are these sets that we could potentially run? We've had, by the time that we start these games, we would have had 10 practices. And I think those can really set up the team for a lot. And of course, moving forward as the, as the season actually starts, we'll be one step ahead. So I'm looking forward to the overall uh, cohesion of the team. But then as far as specific names, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to seeing 
believe it or not, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing Jamari McDowell. Um, I just, I just hear such good things. I think at the beginning of this off season, he has really started to, or he really started off by making a case for a potential red shirt candidate. And then we were losing all sorts of guys off the roster. People were transferring out. And of course he's been pretty good in, in practices so far. So I'm, I know that he's not going to start by any means, but I'm just really excited to see how he is utilized uh, in these games. And, you know, maybe this isn't a guy that decides to transfer after one year because he's not going to start next year. I mean, you know, uh, we're of course moving into a different time of college basketball, but it'll be good to see how our young guys perform, how our newcomers perform and especially see Hunter. Derek, I don't know if you've officially claimed Jamari McDowell as your guy yet, but I know you've been talking him up a lot over the summer and you've listed him as kind of one that you think fans will be surprised by once he kind of gets in the mix. And he could be a guy that with the right right opportunity could could overtake some of that spot because of his athleticism. But uh, whether it's him or somebody else, you know, who do you think has the most to gain or the most – impact that they can they can find during this upcoming trip which guy is going to stand out in that area yeah jamari's very interesting to me he he loves all the right things defense uh he can be the ultimate kind of three and d guy um i i've kind of gone back and forth all off season who that kind of eighth man in the rotation will be right now i'm kind of leaning parker brown but i don't know ask me again in a month or maybe it's tomorrow mcdowell again um i'm actually most interested for el marco jackson from that standpoint, I think he can help himself a ton. I'm kind of under the estimation at this point in time that among the three guys competing for that starting two spot, El Marco, Arterio, and Nick Timberlake, that El Marco Jackson has been the best player so far. But how is the fit? Because of those three, he's probably the worst shooter. So you kind of run into a conflict here of, you know, we hear Bill Self sometimes in other years be like, do I play my five best guys, my five most talented guys, or do I play the five guys that fit together, right? Um, and either way, like all three of those players are going to play a, a good chunk of minutes, and that'll be the case for Marco Jackson. But, um, you know, I want to see – and, and I, I guess this applies too. Like if Nick Timberlake goes out there and shoots 50% from three over three games, like that will obviously be good for him or he plays well on defense. But if Marco Jackson is as advertised in these three games – I might start to inch closer to being like he's going to be the starter at the two uh, this early on. Yeah, I still think that's probably most fans' biggest question mark is, you know, what does that starting five lineup look like? I mean, we can get into how are KJ, Hunter, and Kevin all going to play together because that's kind of a interesting trio on the court at the same time. But I think most fans are like, all right, who's going to take that two spot? And, you know, between Arterio and El Marco, who's most likely to push – Timberlake out or push him to the three. So I think that's one that a lot of us are going to be, um, you know, tuning into. Of course, unfortunately, we don't get to watch the games this week. Um, as of yet, they're not going to be televised, but can certainly listen to Brian Hay Brian Haney and Greg Gurley call the games. Um, I I'm just looking forward to hearing KU basketball on the air again. Um, you know, being a lifelong fan, there's never a time throughout the year where I'm like, all right, I don't want to see KU basketball right now. Like I'm just KU basketball every day. So I'm just excited to see them playing again. Um, I, I'm very intrigued by what potential rotations and lineups we'll see out there. And I think that was one I was going to ask you guys here is give me each of you, give me like one five man lineup that you'd like to see Bill play with during this trip. I know Spencer, you alluded to the fact that this is an opportunity to just test things and do something that, that Bill doesn't normally do because typically a Bill self coach team is he finds his rotation and he dwindles it down and he doesn't, he doesn't really experiment a lot with, with different lineups. So what is a lineup each of you guys would like to see tested out this, this week? That's a toughie. I think, I mean, I, I think immediately what goes through my head is I'm, I'm really all about the newcomers, but also um, if we're experimenting, what would it look like for <laughs> how crazy would it be to have Dewan off the floor? Because uh, I think we've relied on Dewan a lot over the over his time being a point guard for us. So um, what does it look like when a guy like El Marco or Arterio Morris is, is running the floor? When Dewan is taking a seat on the bench, I'm just curious what that looks like. Um, very, very 
excited to see how uh, Nick Timberlake does with um, with his shooting and how that transitions into this elevated level, if you will, of play. So maybe uh, Arterio and Nick, and then I'm going to jump back to Jamari. What if he had to run a little bit of minutes at the three? Uh, and then we got KJ and Hunter together. I think we're all curious still. What's it going to look like with KJ next to Hunter? Um, but that would be fun to see if, if for whatever reason, maybe uh, Dewan got into foul trouble. Would we survive? We'll find out. Uh, I'd like to see a, a small ball lineup. I'd like to see KJ at the five and see how that that works. And because you can load up on defense, you can lo- play you know a multiple guard lineup, which we've seen Bill do in the past. Because there's going to be a lot of teams that will probably try to throw in a, a couple of those lineups where your five guy is going to be your six eight six nine rim runner. So I'd like to see uh, Bill experiment a little bit with that. Obviously, I don't want Hunter off the floor for very long. But if we can run it in stints of five minutes and, you know, just play a really quick transition game, uh, you know, I think that'd be a good way for us to throw in a different a couple lineups here that can maybe throw off a defense, especially if they're throwing in different schemes if they're going zone versus man, stuff like that. So I'd be curious to see, because I, I think uh, KJ could capable, be very capable of playing the five just because his size athleticism, even though he's lacking in the height a little bit. So I'll, I'll be curious to see if Bill throws that out there. Yeah, it's, it's certainly tough to experiment, right? They have 10 scholarship players and one of them hypothetically is going to redshirt with Zach Clements. Um, it makes it tough, like starting lineup with your front court, KJ Adams, Hunter Dickinson, you want to see that as far as the uh, kind of smaller ball lineups, even around Hunter Dickinson when Kevin's in at the four, and then you're playing three of those guards together. I want to see that. But here's a here's kind of a, I don't know how much we'll see this, but I kind of do want to see it just in case as like a possible backup emergency lineup. The one thing that right now KU doesn't have a lot of on the roster, like Okay, hypothetically, if Dewan Harris did get in foul trouble, like JB was kind of talking about, or, you know, rolled an ankle or something, you at least do have those other point guards that you can go to. If, you know, kind of same thing for shooting guard, you got a lot of options there, right, with El Marco, Nick, and, um, and Arterio. Uh, at the three, again, you can play any of those guards at the three, basically. If you want to play smaller, you can play Jamari McDowell, like same goes for the two, Kevin McCuller. Uh, five position, you can play Hunter Dickinson, KJ Adams, Parker Brown. The four position is the one where you're most thin. Right. You have KJ Adams is going to play there a lot, but he's also going to play some five. Kevin McCuller is going to play there some, but he's also going to play some three. Uh, and without Marcus Adams, you don't have that other four on the roster. You're not going to put El Marco Jackson or something at the four. I'll be interested to see if they experiment at all, putting Parker Brown at the four with Hunter Dickinson at the five. Just as a backup option, like what if KJ Adams gets in foul trouble and you're playing against a bigger team? Or dare even put Zach Clements in at the four, not from a standpoint of, again, if he's playing as the red shirt, not that he's going to play this year, but there was a comment from Zach Clements in the uh, Kansas city star about um, wanting to play the power forward Mm long-term. And if that is something that is actually going to be entertained, who knows if Bill Self's actually going to go with that, or if that's just something he believes, uh, then let's see it in in an instance like this and see how it works. I'm glad you brought that up because the the direction I was going to take this in a second is yeah that four spot in this current roster construction i don't think you can say we have your typical college basketball four man like we've you know like Jalen solid four man the last couple of years um this roster is so unique in the fact that hunter dickinson can be your traditional five man but he's got enough skill that if he wasn't seven one he would be your your stretch four stretch five kind of guy so yeah i think that one will be interesting obviously we know we're going to see a lot of kj alongside hunter but you know what do they do in those scenarios where is it kevin sliding down to the four do they go with a little bit bigger lineup and and see parker brown next to him i think that one's going to be very intriguing and you brought up zach clements and that was one jb and i were talking about off air earlier you know because this is not you know, sanctioned NCAA games, whether he redshirts or not, Zach can play in this. And first off, a little surprising that he did, you know, turn things around and decide to come back. And I know Bill had made a comment or somebody had made a comment the last two weeks or so that uh, Zach actually looks surprisingly improved so far over the summer, not just, you know, physically, but the fact that he had a year, he had the whole year here already, two years here already to get acclimated to the system that he actually has, shown a lot of improvements. So I'm kind of curious, Derek, from your thoughts as far as 
if Zach plays well this week or we start to see him doing a lot more, does that increase the likelihood he doesn't redshirt and that maybe he starts to take those minutes away from, from Parker or, you know, the fact that we're already low on scholarship players that instead of redshirting and we just roll with Hunter as the main five, Zach and Parker fight for backup minutes. And then maybe one of them gets five minutes a night at the four. So what's your kind of thoughts on, on Clements being back and how we could see him utilize the next couple of weeks? I think if it's close, uh, you just redshirt him and you have Parker Brown at that point in time. I have heard good things about Parker Brown too, but you are right. Like the whole idea, the plan of redshirting Zach Clements, it's just a plan. If, if he is amazing and, and, you know, this is a former top 40 recruit. If he starts to hit, if he hits that potential of being that type of guy, then Bill Self's not just going to be like, you know what, this guy actually turned out to be really good. I'm just not going to play him this year. That's not how he rolls. He rolls to win games. So these games, yeah, they could be important for Zach Clements. The practices leading up to the season, very important for Zach Clements because um, even though the likelihood is he'll redshirt, I refuse to believe that if he is by far the better center between him and Parker Brown, that Bill Self would just be like, nah, we're, we're just going to roll with it. Again, if it's close, if it's, you know, Zach Clements is one iota better than Parker Brown, then at that point, like, sure, it's not that big of a difference. Um, but, I mean, also it comes into play with, with do they add that 11th player? Do they add get up to 12 scholarship players? Because, you know, it is tough to redshirt a guy when you only have 10 uh, scholarship mm-hmm. players on your team. So – uh, I think that plays into it too. And and then, yeah, I guess going back to what lineups we see experimented with, do we see them play the four at all? And we've heard good things about um, Parker Brown's athleticism and was that Clements? Um, he's done well against some stretch big men, but uh, the questions are going to be on the defensive end. So I don't think it would be yeah. crazy if, if a red shirt were pulled or anything, but I, at this point it's still like a very high percentage that he does red shirt. Yeah. I still think, I think you're right there. It's likely he red shirts, um, it, it just feels a little weird. You know, you go out and get – actually, for first off, I I was on the Parker Brown train well before it was announced that he was coming over. I was like, that would be so cool. It would fit perfectly. We need a backup big. No expectations. You know, he's got the Brown name. Bring him back over. So I was on board with that from the start. But it would feel kind of little little weird or awkward. You know, Zach comes back. Hey, I'm going to red shirt. So maybe Parker feels like he's got his chance. And then – all right, Zach's actually performing well. And now it's like, all right, what do we do with both of you guys? Because you're similar enough that clearly you're not going to be a large part of the minutes rotation because Hunter's going to be out there a lot. But what do we do with you? You know, what is the game plan there? So I think that'll be another interesting one to kind of watch over the the week and the next couple of weeks before we get into uh, fall camp and all that. Um, Okay, now I want to transition into a little bit more off-season talk. You know, this week during press conference, Bill had mentioned – how he was super impressed with the development of Kevin McCuller over the summer and how he was just very impressed with how different he looks coming back out of the draft process. He's improved, supposedly has improved his jumper and offensive skill set a bit. And he had kind of talked about that right now. He looks like the best player on the team. And so, of course, naturally to KU fans, that kind of raises the question of, of Hunter Dickinson versus Kevin McCuller, because up until a week ago, everyone's probably been thinking, all right, we're going to get Hunter Dickinson a billion touches a night. He's going to average 18 to 20. Everything's running through him. Okay, Kevin's back. All right, Kevin's going to slide in somewhere in there. Him and KJ have to figure out how to shoot. But now, you know, I'm of the opinion, I think Bill's an incredibly smart coach. So I think some of this is, one, talking up the ability of Kevin McClure to make other teams think about, okay, well, as much attention as we need to give to Hunter, we got to at least think about Kevin. So I think some of it's that. But – I guess I know we haven't had a lot of practices really watched, but what is your your take on Bill's comments there as far as which guy is going to be more impactful or more important to the season this year? Hunter Dickinson still has the learning curve of learning the offense. And, and Bill Self talked about this too with the presser that they haven't put everything in yet. So I do think that is part of it. Once, once they have everything in and he fully understands everything, which Kevin McCuller obviously has a head start on, um that'll come back around but it's it's kind of a philosophical question too i didn't take it in any way as him being like kevin mcculler is going to lead the team in scoring now or this is like i still expect that to be hunter dickinson i still expected him you know put up those 18 and 9 numbers but philosophically if you have a center who averages let's say 18 points nine rebounds per game but struggles defensively in space 
Whereas you have a wing who, let's say Kevin can get up to, I don't know, 14 points, seven rebounds per game, two or three assists per game. Uh, I asked Nick Timberlake at the media veil the other day, like who are, who, who's impressing you shooting the ball? He, he first of all, he's like, well, I'm really good at shooting, but um, <laughs> the, 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 so. the next name I know, right? The, the next name that he mentioned was Kevin McCuller. So does that mean that the shooting is going up? So let's say the efficiency goes up and then it's the philosophical debate of, you know, do you take the guy who's averaging more points and rebounds and doing this or that? Or do you take the guy who is kind of a jack of all trades in every way? He's second on your team in you know, points and rebounds, but he is one of the best defenders in the country and he's ultra switchable. And I think for a coach and for Bill Self specifically with how much he cares about the defensive end of the basketball, I can understand why that would be the case. Also, I think he's taken into account like Kevin McCuller is probably taking over as like a leader and that probably matters to him too. So um, I, I don't view this in any way that like Hunter Dickinson isn't performing. I, I know that's not what you're saying, but I, I think Hunter Dickinson is going to be just fine. I also don't view this as being like, oh, Kevin McCuller is going to be a first team All-American necessarily. But I do view this as Kevin McCuller is ready to have an even better season than he's had the past couple of years. And that, you know, anytime you get these college basketball teams where you can argue like they have multiple really good players and you can be like, I don't know, I know this guy's going to be the, na the National Player of the Year candidate or the first team All-American, but I really like this guy better. Like, I, I think back to the Villanova team that, that crushed KU in the Final Four, and I was always a truther that like, well, I know Jalen Brunson's going to be the, the National Player of the Year, but this is Mikhail Bridges guy, man. Like, every time I see him play, he's so valuable on this team. And I think that's probably the direction we're going to end up with with this KU team, which is obviously if it ends up happening that way, that's a great thing to have. Yeah, my initial reaction to that when he's like, oh, he's going to – I think he's fully capable of making the jump that Ochai and Jalen took. I did not take that as, okay, he's going to be the leading scorer on the team. It was more of he's going to make that jump of improvement of significance and importance on the court. Not that he wasn't already important last year in everything we did, but I think I, I looked at that more as he is making that next step as the true leader of the team moving forward. You know, Hunter's probably still the most talented guy that's going to be on the court any second he's there. But the the impact Kevin can provide offensively and defensively and as a leader on the team, I, I took it more as, hey, he's going to take that next step and be the vocal leader when he's on the court. He's going to kind of be that glue guy out there when he's on the floor to kind of streamline everything through. And that combination of his – offensive skill set, defensive ability, ability to to get rebounds, putting that alongside a true dominant big man in Hunter Dickinson, and then a tremendous floor spacer, floor general in Dewan Harris, who also, you know, him and Kevin should be fighting for national defensive player of the year honors. Like that, that, that trio there just gets me super excited. The fact that we're going to have three true, you know, senior type leaders that you don't get a lot of in college basketball. And that the fact that they're going to be on the court at the same time has me excited. So yeah, I took that more as he's going to make the jump as a leader. You know, he may, you know, I, I like what you said in your episode on lockdown the other day that, you know, maybe he goes from nine, 10 points a game to 12 to 15. Okay, great. Um, no one's asking him really to be the top dog scorer because that's not his strongest skill set. You know, it might be this year, but we need him to be that defensive guy that locked down every team's best player fight for offensive rebounds. And, you know, it's, it's possible that KU has two guys kind of like, like last year in a different way, but two guys that average eight to 10 rebounds a night. So if you're getting 20 rebounds a night between Hunter and, and Kevin, you know, that's, that's some pretty solid production. So yeah, that's how I took it. Um, if it is the case where McCuller's offensive game picks up a lot, then I think that just makes us better. Then you don't have to rely on Hunter. So I think going into the season early on, the summer questions were, well, if it's not hitting with Hunter that night where the defenses are just pounding him in the paint and he's not getting good looks, where does the offense come from? And, you know, some of that we saw last year too. If Jalen is struggling, where are we getting points? And, you know, uh, KJ took advantage of that here and there on that pick and roll game. And Dewan had a few games here and there. But I think that's just a question fans are going to have is um, – can McCuller be that go-to guy if Hunter's in foul trouble or Hunter's just, you know, it's not a good night for him, bad matchup or something. Can Kevin take over a game um, like what Jalen and Ochai did in that, in that jump? So that, that was my take on it. Um, as we kind of slowly wrap up here, I want to get into some KU basketball season. What ifs uh, just some like scenarios to preview the season. Um, and then JB and Spencer, if you guys have anyone you want to throw out here too, by all means, go for it. Um, 
early on in the summer, we were talking about scoring and who's going to be the guy. And I've gone back and forth on what should you expect from a guy like Nick, Nick Timberlake and what is realistic. You know, Derek, I know you've said, you know, if he averages that 25 to 30 minutes as a consistent starter, then yes, we should expect him to be um, a big part of the offense. So I guess scenario one, if Timberlake is averaging above 10 points a game, what is the the outlook you think that has on the team? So if if he is getting the minutes that we're talking about and is, you know, number three in scoring, what does that kind of say about the team's success for the season? I think that's a good thing because I view him as being the best shooter on the team. And I view the thing that could inhibit him from playing more, like the difference of him playing 15 minutes a game versus getting that 25 to 30 is can he at least get like near average on the defensive end of the court? Um, he struggled on that end of the court at Towson. Now, obviously it was different. He was having to take on a big load on offense and it's tough to have the energy both ways. Also though, you're playing tougher competition now, more athletic competition in the big 12. Isaiah Moss wasn't a great defender. He was, you know, average, below average, but KU had good enough defensive players around him. Doak, Garrett, Dotson, this team has good enough defensive players around him that if he can just get, you know, be below average defender, then you're going to stay on the court long enough to make an impact offensively, which is where you're going to make your biggest impact and be able to space the floor and be this team's best three-point shooter. So if that does end up happening, if he's getting 10 points per game, that means that he's playing a good amount of minutes. That means he's getting a good amount of shots, which means he's doing a good enough job defensively. And all those are great things for KU. Spencer, let me throw this one at you. If KJ finds himself being the second leading scorer for the season, what does that say about the season outlook? Well, I'd still like to take a look at the totals because if he's the second leading scorer at 10 points a game, I think it'd be a little concerning. But I would say that the outlook looks pretty good because, again, the value you're seeking from Kevin is going to be from the defensive end, his versatility. He can switch off from guy to guy. So I think if he does take an offensive leap, it's just pretty much, uh, you know, going to be a found treasure sort of situation because we're going to have other guys that can get their own shots on the perimeter. And the cool thing is, you know, I would say that Kevin doesn't even have to take a leap in scoring. He could average the same amount of points as last year, but in the manner he's getting those points is more from the perimeter. That's going to keep defenses a little bit more honest. That's going to open up the middle for Hunter Dickinson, and people are going to be more hesitant to collapse on him after two dribbles. So I, I don't even think necessarily he has to take a step up. Uh, so if he does, I think that goes very well for us, and I would be excited to see the manner in which he's getting all of his points there. All right, make a prediction now. How many three-point jumpers does KJ take this season? Uh, per game? Just oh, overall, per game, full season. If he's I, putting in the work that we're here and, and he is having an effective year offensively. I think if he takes over five, Bill Yanks him, so I'll keep it at three and a half per game. For the whole, okay, per, the, I yeah, per, say the per whole game. Season. Yeah, between three and four per game. I'd be shocked if he's taking three three-pointers a game. I think there's no way doing it to him. That's that's going to be the thing. And if he's improving a little bit, I think he'll have the green light a little bit more. I mean, if he's in the gym, I give him one per game. But <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I just don't see KJ doing it. I don't, I don't even really care how much he's improved his shot. I just think there's going to be other better opportunities, other sport, uh, other positions that you could pass the ball to, and hopefully get a more accurate three point shot from. I think you're going to see more of the mid-range than the three. Like, I could get on board with him taking two or three mid-range a game. Uh, I think last year he only took three three-pointers all year, which actually is hard to remember because you're like, wait, I don't even remember him taking that many. I'll say he takes one every other game even. So, I don't know, like 15, 20? Yeah, you know, that's a safe bet. You know what? I completely thought you said Kevin McCuller. Oh. That's my bad. That's, yeah. I, I, was, I was like, man, he was not that bad of a shooter. Like, Boy, Kevin probably <laughs> should take one to three a game. K if KJ, oh, yeah. No, I'll give KJ one, one every few games. And, and I, I I'd agree even, on the mid-range numbers there. Yeah. I'd even take Kevin shooting 33% from three if it means it's three attempts every game and he hits one of them. Like 33% is not fantastic, but I'd rather see that on one to three attempts a game than like, He's going two for seven from three every game or something. Because if he's shooting that many threes and he's not hitting, you know, that has me a little worried about the the production. Um, all right, next before you, Derek, this is kind of more the the newcomers in the backcourt. Um, 
more of a which would you rather pick um, and whichever one you pick then tell what kind of impact does that have. So Arterio versus um, El Marco, which guy is most likely, or, or in this case, which would you prefer getting more than 25 minutes a game? And if so, what is that impact going to have on the team? I am very high on El Marco. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm starting to get closer to being like he's going to be the starter. I'm not quite there, but I'm starting to build that momentum. I just, in watching him play, that dude is so incredibly athletic. He's so fun to watch. He can blow by basically anybody. Uh, his ability to, you know, draw the defense in and then kick out to somebody. Like, honestly, he's going to be a really good pair when he's playing with Dewan Harris or Nick Timberlake because Dewan is really good at hitting the set shots, like when he's just standing there waiting for the ball. And I think Marco is going to play off of that well with him. Uh, he's a good passer. He's got good vision. I think because of the athleticism, he should be able to be a good defender and pressure the basketball. Um, and, and I think he's just going to be like a really fun player. He's uh, it seems to be a really bright kid and a really like, I don't know, um, just kind of happy, like forthcoming kid that I, I think fans are going to really get behind. I think he plays in a very fun style that he's going to have a lot of hu fun highlight plays too. Um, so I, I'm going to go on Marco Jackson there. Hmm. Hey, Derek, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. You think, do you think El Marco Jackson is one and done? And if, or maybe a follow up question would be, what do you think it takes for him to be one and done? Does he have to start to be one and done? Or can he have incredible production off the bench and be one and done? What's, what's your take on El Marco? I know it's a prediction for far in advance. Um, but what do you think on, on El Marco being one and done? Well, it's funny. I've been scouring some mock drafts and I've seen a few that like maybe don't even have him on there because they're expecting him to be like a two year guy. And I've seen a few others that have him like a lottery pick. I think athletically he's there. Athletically, he's there for sure. Um, it's just about the jump shot to me. Um, if he shoots, you know, I don't know, 32, 33 percent from three, somewhere in that range, I could see on, on like a decent volume. I'm not just talking he launches up one a game or something. If he can get two or three attempts per game and hit, you know, around low 30s, uh, that might be, a, be enough to get him there with the athleticism. And as far as the starting thing, um, if you expect Kansas to be a really good team, which I do, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, I view him as being someone, and even if he is coming off the bench, he's probably going to be playing 20 plus minutes per game. And how many guys from, you know, freshman one and done from Duke and Kentucky have we seen? play around 20 minutes per game and then be first round draft picks just because of very specific scenarios, which KU has because they have Dewan Harris. Yeah. He's definitely got, I think a little bit more of an uphill battle to be a one and done. And I don't think that's necessarily as much of his skill set as it is just the, the shakeup of the roster. Um, how often in the last 20 years of Bill Self being here, have we had a, Freshman come in who is not, you know, Andrew Wiggins, Joel Embiid, Ben McAmore le level, even Grady Dick this last year, and have that as an expectation. I know we've had some fringe guys, Kelly Oubre, made into lottery after his freshman season. But I think he's just got a little bit more of an uphill battle to get there because he's probably not going to be a featured part of the offense unless he just comes out and surprises us. So I think for him to get to that point, he's definitely got to have a huge season, play a lot of minutes, and, and showcase more than just the athleticism, um, his, his ability to go attack the rim and score. Um, I don't think they're – now, this isn't the best comparison, but I think their play style and athleticism, if he can kind of play like um, uh, Dennis Smith Jr. from several years ago at NC State before he got drafted to the Mavs, similar you know capabilities, skill set, athleticism. If he can just like really showcase that – then he's he's going to get a lot of a lot of scouts watching because you know the NBA drafts all about the potential and they they go crazy over people's athleticism. But yeah, I think he's got he's got an uphill battle there. Uh, Spencer, then I'm going to ask you the kind of opposite question: If Arterio is the guy that's getting more minutes than El Marco, give me the argument as to why that is a good thing for KU versus El Marco being the guy. Well, I, I think you get, number one, you get a really strong defensive backcourt, which I think a lot of people underestimate because uh, we're going to be going up against a really stacked league in the Big 12, a lot of really talented guards. So having two guys that are complete shutdown defenders can be very beneficial and very valuable. We don't necessarily have to rely on it for scoring either because we're going to have, you know, a five guy that's going to be a double-double every single night. So, I, you know, and we're, we're going to get someone, and obviously Arterio, you know, 
doesn't have the most experience in the world just being a sophomore, but we do get a little bit more experience and a guy that has played in the Big 12 before as opposed to a guy like El Marco Jackson. Now, again, I think obviously El Marco's got a lot of upside and a higher ceiling, but I do think that Arterio can provide a lot of versatility on the defensive end, which a lot of people don't know the, the value that can bring for us over the course of a season. Yeah, I think that I think that's pretty pretty solid right there, pretty spot on. Obviously, you know he's going to bring the defensive capability night in and night out, and that's you know Bill talks all the time about how his number one priority always is you got to be able to perform on the defensive end if you want to play. Um, but yeah, I, I could easily see both sides being correct there. If El Marco's having a great season, fantastic, that's good for us. If Arterio's having a great season, both of those are good for us. If both of them are having a good season, then that kind of makes me wonder if Timberlake's struggling and not getting a lot of playing time. Right. Um, but again, I don't think any of those scenarios are bad ones. Uh, last one I want to throw out to you guys, and then we'll do one more one more quick topic. Um, if Parker Brown averages north of 10 minutes a game, what does that say about the season? Not as likely, but could happen. Because we know, and we, we looked at this over the summer, there's only been one player in Bill Self's tenure, well, I guess technically two, that have been a true traditional five-man that's averaged more than 30 minutes a game. That was Jeff Withy in the 2012 National Championship runner-up year. And then um, I believe Cole's senior year, he was either right at 30 or just under 30. And then Wayne Simmons was the other one, if, if you if you count him as, as the true five back in 0405. But So there's going to be some minutes there at the five spot for sure. So if Parker somehow manages to get 10 minutes plus a game, what does that say about the season? Man, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. We have we have two guys that are elite guys in KJ and Hunter that are going to be starting next to each other, and they both need a backup. So in my eyes, with Parker being ten plus minutes a game, maybe that just means we're. Um, I think it means really good things for Parker. I think that means he's doing everything we needed him to be because what did we say when we first got him? We were saying we just need him to be a Mitch Lightfoot type of guy that can come in and, and be the relief guy um, and let our stars get some rest on the bench. So I think it's a very good thing if, if ultimately if he's averaging north of 10 minutes a game, um, the only downside I suppose would be that the more minutes he gets – means the less minutes that some of our guards would get maybe in a five um you know or four guard lineup around a five um we wouldn't maybe see that as much and and if we don't see that as much well who is lacking in their production to force bill self to call more plays with you know two bigs and three guards so uh, i don't know who that would be that's lacking uh, certainly we could speculate but um, ultimately, I think it's a pretty good thing when you look at our depth and, you know, we're like Derek said earlier, we're pretty thin at the four. We're, we're thin on size, uh, assuming that that red shirt stays on Zach Clements. We've got some questions to answer there with our depth. Any other scenarios you guys want to throw out before I briefly go through our last topic or any other questions you guys have for Derek? I would like to throw out um... – what would happen if DeWan takes a scoring leap instead of uh, McCuller? Because that's why I've always said watching any game last year, if he gets in the eight to 10 point range, we were a completely different team. When he is not looking to score at all, that's when you start to see turnovers. That's when you start to see a little bit lack of fluidity in the offense. So what if he gets to say 10 to 12 points per game? I, I think that's totally reasonable. I think that can absolutely happen. Um, we've seen him, like I said, be a good set shooter. He continues to add to kind of his, I don't know, floater game and that little like sweeping underhand hook that he kind of does. Um, no, that wouldn't shock me at all. I think that'd be a good thing. Anytime you can have more guards specifically who can create for themselves and score off the bat. The big thing to me is if he's getting to 12, 10 to 12 points per game, can he go from being someone who is really only hitting threes when it's off the catch and he's left open to being someone who, if you guys remember like Frank Mason, his senior year, was automatic whenever they ran a pick and roll and the defender went under the screen mm, and it gave yeah. him that space and time to kind of load up because he didn't have the quickest release three-pointer. But if he did that, it gave him more than enough time. 
That's how I view it with Dewan Harris. Like he doesn't have the quickest release three pointer, but to where if somebody does go under the screen with how lethal he can be in pick and roll and is trying to defend against KJ or Hunter Dickens and roll into the rim, that he can make them pay there. So if you're getting 10, 12 a game, maybe you get a few more of that. But yeah, I mean, anytime you're getting your point guard who already is is great at everything else, if he's scoring more, like that would be a great thing for KU. And I would hope that would also mean he's either one consistently hitting from three or he's finding a way to get to the line. And I think that's another thing you, you look at this roster for this upcoming years, who's going to be the guy to outside of Hunter, because he's going to get fouled a lot. Who's going to be that guy that's going to attack the rim and, and get to the, get to the free throw line. So if Dewan's coming off those pick and rolls and everyone's sagging on Hunter, you know, maybe he can get himself an extra three to four looks a night and that, that helps get him to that double digit. But yeah, I don't think that would be a bad thing either, unless it just means that a guy like Kevin or KJ is just shooting so poorly from the floor that we have to rely on Dewan getting those double digits, double digit points. But again, the way this team is going to be constructed, and I, I know you've talked about it on Locked On and we've seen in other podcasts here and there too, if KU is as elite defensively as they have the potential to be, they they can probably survive a lot of those 55 to 60 point nights where the offense isn't clicking, but they're holding teams to under 28% shooting and they're only getting to 40. So yeah, I think that's a that's another good scenario to to throw out there and one that if if Dewan does take that increase, that's probably only for the good. Uh, all right, last thing I wanted to just kind of briefly, briefly touch on is the shakeup of the Big 12. Um, a lot of stuff's gone down the last year since since Brett's taken over as commissioner. He's doing a lot of fantastic things to continue to grow the Big 12. With the recent addition of Colorado, we're slowly getting back to the, the, the old school Big 12. You know, you still got teams like Mizzou and Nebraska out there. And I'm not necessarily advertising that they come back per se. But, Derek, in, in your opinion, with how you see the Big 12 kind of shaping up and Colorado coming in, what's your – What's your like excitement level to see a lot of these new teams entering in, you know, Houston, BYU, um, Houston, you know, their program's probably some of the best basketball they've had in, in, you know, almost 30 years. So what's your kind of your outlook on the big 12 as a whole moving forward, whether it's basketball or football, and then maybe what are some other teams that are kind of on your radar that you would be interested or intrigued by if they said, Hey, can we come over too? Oh, I, I love the Colorado one. I, I think back to a lot of fun times when Colorado was in the Big 12 or in the Big 8 and some of the great memories. I mean, just from a Kansas perspective, you, you think back to the 95 game where they went on the road against the fourth-ranked Buffs. Uh, Todd Reesing burning his red shirt. Akeem Tlaib had a couple interceptions in that game. Um, you think back to that one. I don't know, man. There's just a, a, a lot of fun, I guess, memories with them in the conference. They always felt like a better fit for me. It's a fun place that you know fans can get to travel to. Uh, it's not too far away from Lawrence. You can drive there if you want and you get kind of a uh, a nice scenery and everything going on there. You can stay in Denver or whatever you want to do. So I, I, I'm very all about that. I think geographically it just makes a lot of sense. I love that move. Um, I think that, yeah, Houston is going to be great with the basketball side of things. Uh, I think football, they have potential because they're in Texas. If, if you can ever kind of get that thing rolling with uh, some high-level recruiting in the, in the area. BYU is going to be a team that I, uh, I think will actually fit in really nicely, especially if they are able to add even more uh, from the Pac-12. I mean, already you're kind of close to, to Colorado, but uh, they've been playing closer to Power 5 schedules than a lot of other group of five teams. So I think that'll be good. They actually have a really good home court advantage in basketball. I'm excited for the first time Kansas goes out there. UCF will be fun because I just want to go out there and go to like Disney World. But uh, I think I just had, I just had the the play-by-play guy from UCF on, on my radio show this past week. And uh, I think a lot of people would echo this. He, he just forthright said UCF is going to be the most hated fan base in the Big 12. <laughs> and I think some people are already seeing that on social media. So oh, I, yeah. I don't know. I guess it's good to have a villain. I've been on a lot of Twitter spaces the last week uh, about the Big 12 changes. And there's a lot of uh, UCF fans who were talking up a big game, but also like playing the victim card of, we don't like to be called Central Florida. We are UCF. Don't think of us as that. And then KU fans on the flip side going, you guys are just Central Florida. You've got Disney World. Welcome to the big show. You're going to get smoked. And I can see that they're a pretty rowdy bunch. And I, I could I could liken them to what you get out of Iowa State fans where they're chirping all the time and trying to find their seat at the table. So I think that's interesting. But how about any other teams on the outside that you think the Big 12 – I mean, I'm sure there are ongoing conversations currently, um, but of the ones that you've heard, is there any teams out there that you would like to see us go after? 
Well, for sure, Oregon would be a great pickup. And there's some talk about, well, Oregon, Washington, they want to join the Big Ten. Could they use the Big 12 as just a launching pad? Honestly, though, if I'm the Big 12, I'm like, sure. If you want to use this as a launching pad, come join our conference for a few years. It'll further destabilize the Pac-12. Then we can add even more Pac-12 schools. And then if you end up leaving for the Big Ten in a few years, we'll just replace you with other schools. And guess what? You're going to have to pay these big exit fees that are going to give us a bunch of money. So I'd be all about that, but we'll see the answers. It seems like Arizona is the big one right now, which I'd be all for. It would only strengthen the, the conference in basketball. Um, you know, I think Tommy Lloyd, I think the world of him as, as a head coach uh, it, from what they've done. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a big enough market in what they'd be bringing over. That one makes so much sense to me if they could bring over Arizona. And uh, it feels like that's the one that's being kind of rumored the most right now. So I'm all for any of those. Um, if it does get to a point where, you know, let's say they do add Arizona and they add one other Pac-12 school and they're like, hey, we want to get to 16. We want to equal out the numbers. Um, at that point, you're probably choosing between either like UConn or Gonzaga mm -hmm. or uh, a Memphis or something like that. I guess you'd have to choose somebody with a football school if you want to equal it out for all sports. But I, I still remain that if you're going to add some of these Pac-12 schools, I think adding Gonzaga as like a basketball only addition would be a lot of fun. Yeah, that'd be that'd be some big time performances and, and key matchups there. I think the other intriguing one would be UConn just because of the fact they've been so successful basketball wise the last couple of years, you know, Maybe it brings over a football program that isn't quite consistently good, but it just adds another team in there, and that's always for the for the better for the conference. But yeah, I think the, the big one would be fun, and this is only this is probably down the road if all hell breaks loose across college athletics, and that would be doing anything possible to steal you know a North Carolina and have these big time North Carolina KU basketball matchups year in and year out. That's probably dreaming a little bit though, because that that means if that happens, that means there's so many other dominoes falling and. Eventually, you know, we're probably 15 years away from, you know, three or two massive, massive conferences or a complete split from the NCAA and having like these divisions of the top programs and the eh programs. Um, but yeah, Big 12 should be a lot of fun. I think basketball, I think we'll improve again. I mean, you know, it's hard to compete with SEC football for sure. Um, but basketball wise, I mean, there's a good chance we have four top 10 programs this year in college basketball. And that's always good for the conference. Um, but yeah, just exciting to have all that coming through, but guys, any other questions you have? Yes, sir. Perfect. Uh, Derek, thanks so much for hopping on with us today. Had a lot of fun. Hope we can uh, do some more of this down the road. Um, where can everybody tune in to you specifically week in and week out? Yeah. So uh, rock shock sports talk. It's on Monday through Friday on KLWN in Lawrence with the local Lawrence flagship. You can actually listen to the, the KU basketball games this week there. Um, and you can also stream at klwn.com and uh, the KLWN app. You can also find me with Locked on Jayhawks anywhere you hear podcasts and on YouTube. Between now and upcoming football season, what are some big things for us to look out for on the Locked On podcast? Uh, we're going to start doing our football positional previews, I think, coming up here uh, pretty shortly. We're going to be breaking down whatever happens in Puerto Rico and um, you know, I, I think KU football uh, fall camp is going to start up on Tuesday. We're going to start hearing from players, coaches. So we're going to be really diving into football here uh, once the calendar flips to August. Awesome. Well, there you go, guys. Again, Derek, thanks so much for joining us. You know, this has been another episode of the KC Sports Authority podcast. You can find us over on YouTube and on Spotify. Uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button when you're watching or listening and share it with your friends. You can also hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram with any KU basketball take you have or any sports take in general. You know, Let us know what you're looking forward to yourselves as fans this week with the Puerto Rico games. Um, if you happen to find some way to watch it, you know, maybe let us know. I don't want to encourage any illegal activity to go on, but it would be fun to see those potential matchups with the, with the NBA guys. But thanks again, guys, for joining us. We look forward to having you guys in the next episode. And as always, guys, rock chalk. Rock chalk. Rock chalk.